So again, good evening and welcome to our seminar on expert witnesses in homicide cases. This evening we're going to focus on two specific areas that uh, feature regularly in such cases, and they, they are psychiatry and pathology. We have a star-studded lineup of speakers. We have Professor Michael Koppelman, neuropsychiatrist, Dr. Frank Farnham, forensic psychiatrist, Abigail Bright, a member of Doughty Street Chambers, <coughs> Professor Sarah Hainsworth, <coughs> Professor of Forensic Engineering at the University of Leicester, and Dr. Olaf Bidrisky, who is a forensic pathologist. Each of them will speak for 10, no more than 15 minutes. And there will be a question and answer session at the end. So not at the end of each speaker, but at the end of the talks. And then there'll be some food and drink at the very end. But first, by way of an introduction and a general overview of expert witnesses, you will find a number of handouts um, on your seats. One relates to the biographies of each of the speakers, which gives you an insight into the sorts of work they do. But also there's a handout from me, Siobhan Gray, which just sets out on one page just some very basic points, and I make no excuse and no apology about the basic requirements that you need to think about when dealing with expert witnesses. And I think it's important to go back to basics because sometimes we do forget the very elementary matters. And there are five points that I've identified as being of critical importance. And the first one is, when you've decided that you need an expert, you've got to ask yourself the question, have I got the right expert? So for example, inevitably, in such cases, you'll be seeking to instruct perhaps a forensic psychiatrist. But if your case is dealing with perhaps memory disorder, maybe dementia, or epilepsy, or memory problems, then you will need a forensic, I should say, um, forensic psychiatrist is the one you'd start off with but you need a neuropsychiatrist. And of course, once you've en engaged your expert, you'll, if you have started with a forensic psychiatrist, then you need to talk to him or her about what other specialists you require, such as the neuropsychiatrist, and the same works in pathology. Start off with a forensic pathologist, you have to ask yourself, do you need a neuropathologist? So, do you have the right expert, is a fundamental question. Of course, no doubt, you'll want to secure the leading expert in that particular field. And it is often tricky to secure a leading expert at the standard legal aid rates. But there is provision. The Legal Aid Agency's guidance on the remuneration of experts allows for higher rates to be paid for experts in exceptional circumstances. For example, where the expert's evidence is key to the client's case and either the complexity of the material is such that an expert with a high level of seniority is required or, so it's a disjunctive test here, the material is of such a specialized and unusual nature that only a very few experts are available. And I had a case where we needed an expert to look at ketamine and the effects of ketamine on the brain. And there were really only very few experts around who look at the impact of ketamine, the particular, that particular drug, on the mind. Not just a general psychiatrist, but somebody who specifically deals in ketamine. And the legal aid agency allowed for the high rates of pay because there were only two or three experts in the country. So once you've identified your expert, once you have funding for your expert, the third point, the third critical point, is the expert's report. 
and that expert's report has to be CPR, Criminal Procedure Rules and Criminal Practice Direction 19 compliant. And that is not a box ticking exercise. It is of fundamental importance because there are ramifications, <coughs> repercussions, if the expert fails to adhere to the criminal procedure rules. And Criminal Procedure Rule 19.4 sets out 11 factors from A to K that must be in the expert's report. And one fascinating one, and I say fascinating because what should be in the report is this, where there is a range of opinion on an issue, the expert must summarize the range of opinion and give reasons for the expert's own opinion. So for example, the experts need to say, look, there is a range of opinion on this issue. I'm at one end of this range, but in fact there are other experts, equally as qualified as I am, at the other end of the range. But for the following reasons, I'm at this other end. How often do you see that in an expert report? It's in the rules and it should be in the report. The rules are also helpful in the sense that they, we all know this, we should know this, that opposing experts um, should, uh, the rules say that they should meet and discuss and identify areas of agreement and areas of disagreement and then those issues should be put into a document put before the jury. And of course the trial will then focus on the areas of disagreement. My fourth point is experts in court, and in fact that's a seminar in itself. But the presentation, the presentation of your expert in court. If you look, and I'm looking at really looking at technical jargon here. How many reports do you see that are littered with technical jargon, medical terminology? That the advocates often have to sit googling the terms and translating them into the English language. Get rid of the technical jargon. The, the jury only hear and see it once, and they need to be clear. And as we all know, juries trust those who help them. Please come and sit at the front. What's really helpful is to have a glossary of terms so that the jury can take that away with them, a glossary of all those medical terms. In relation to cross-examining experts, again, a topic seminar in itself, but I just go back to the criminal procedure rules. The criminal procedure rules are an excellent starting place for undermining the expert on the other side. The 11 A to K checklist points that should be in the report, are they in, the, in their report? If not, it's an excellent, as I say, starting point for their cross-examination of the expert. So the rules really, they're not that universally popular, but in the context of expert evidence, they are fundamentally important. My final point, point five, is make sure your expert is at court when the other side's expert is giving evidence. I'm surprised it doesn't always happen. It should. These days, expert evidence is given back to back so that the jury obviously understand the entirety of that evidence at the time. And the importance of your expert being present when the other expert is giving evidence isn't necessarily so that they can tug your gown and help you with cross-examination. That should have been prepared long ago. But it's, it's a psychological issue, really. That that expert, that opposing expert, knows that there's somebody else in the room who knows as more, if not more, than they do about the issue. So those are my five checklist points. I could go on and on, but those are just headlines, basic headlines. I'm now, without further ado, going to hand over to the experts, and please, we're going to begin with Professor Michael Cotton. Thank you. The last time I gave a talk on psychological forms of amnesia, someone who obviously seemed to have come to the wrong lecture put in their feedback that I hadn't addressed the biomechanics, which I thought was a bit of an odd remark. Um, 
So I'm very pleased today that we've got a forensic engineer and you can address the biomechanics. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to talk very rapidly about amnesia, automatism and uh, criminal behaviour. Now, you will all know that in cases of homicide, between 25 and 45% of people charged with homicide claim amnesia for the offence. And this occurs in a variety of circumstances. Some people have medical conditions, such as an automatism, which means that they don't remember. And just occasionally, there may be a dementia or uh, an amnesic syndrome. A lot of people are intoxicated out of their tiny minds, commit an offence and can't remember. A few people are so psychotic they don't remember and then there are the interesting crimes of passion. Today there's only time to talk to you about automatism and crimes of passion. So, automatism. This is an absence of free will or the men's rear uh, in the appeal court, it was described as a complete destruction of voluntary control. Um, I have a clinical definition, which is an abrupt change in behaviour in the absence of conscious awareness or memory for formation associated with certain specific disorders, such as epilepsy, sleep disorders, low blood sugar or head injury. Now this is a much tighter definition than many other people use. Things like PTSD, personality disorder um, have been tried in the courts. They would be excluded by my definition. And as you will know, there is a distinction in English law between a sane automatism, which arises from an external factor, such as a blow to the head or take too much insulin, and results in acquittal and an insane automatism arising from an internal disease such as epilepsy which used to lead automatically to secure hospitalization and still quite commonly does. Now the assumption is that this won't recur and this will but that I'm afraid is medical uh, and psychological nonsense because epilepsy can be well treated and well controlled whereas a diabetic on insulin may have a series of hypos so it doesn't really work and these are some of the main cases that have established this law Bratty said that an epileptic automatism was insane the same ruling was made in Sullivan and in Burgess about sleepwalking. <coughs> Case A was a 39-year-old man who was living with his flatmate, had been done so for many years, they were good friends. A was a diabetic on insulin. He'd recently been changed to human insulin, which um, people often don't realise when they're going hyper. He'd had a low blood sugar the previous evening at about the same time. He took his insulin, but instead of going and eating, he became distracted by a television program and delayed his dinner. The, neighbor, the next thing is that the neighbours observed him chasing his flatmate into the garden with a bread knife. He killed the flatmate, and by the time the police arrived, he was pale, sweaty, agitated, looked like someone in a hypo. He had an amnesic gap for about 45 minutes, and he was acquitted on the grounds of a sane automatism because it was induced by his insulin. B was a sleepwalking case. This man had spent the day out in central London with his girlfriend. He had two pints of beer at lunchtime and a couple of glasses of wine in the evening. They had a pleasant day. They went to bed at midnight. She got up two hours later to go to the loo. She probably awakened him because when she came back, he viciously attacked her, punched and beat her, smashed a bottle over her head. She was forced to the floor. Fortunately, she got away. And by the following morning, he had no recall. He didn't understand why she wasn't there, wondered why the flat was in such a mess. <coughs> 
He'd had a history of sleepwalking since a head injury at 25. He was easily aroused by noise, he complained of noisy neighbours. We did a sleep recording and he had what's known as periodic limb movement disorder, restless legs. Um, the, we concluded that this was a parasomnia-induced automatism. Um, it should have been technically an insane automatism, but he had a clever lawyer who argued that because there had been a head injury and because he drank some alcohol and one or two other factors, that it should be the judge should rule it should be a sane automatism. The judge bought it and he was acquitted, leaving me to worry about the safety of his future girlfriends. <laughs> um, Siklari and Schenk reviewed such cases. More common is that you get these automatism, sleep-related automatism in men sometimes precipitated by psychotropic medication. They often have another sleep disorder, such as sleep apnea, periodic limb movement disorder, which my man had, or sleep deprivation, which my man had. It can be induced by fever or stress, uh, by noise or touch, and alcohol is controversial whether it brings it on or not. And being awakened, which is what it might, might have happened here, is often a precipitant to the violence. It's thought that what happens in slow wave sleep is that the frontal lobes get suppressed in their activity and can no longer keep control on other parts of the brain and hereby you get the automatism. The third case was a seizure induced automatism. This man had temporal lobe epilepsy with classical findings. He used to have an aura and then he'd have a convulsion and then he'd either be benignly confused or fall asleep or have an automatism. He'd been tried on many anticonvulsants and there was very poor control of his seizures. He had rather strange delusional preoccupations and there have been two episodes of more frank paranoid psychoses that had lasted only a few days. During the automatisms, after a seizure, he would travel great distances. On one occasion, he ended up in Scarborough, having started in Huddersfield, and he'd frequently been violent. On one occasion, he had a seizure in the shower. He went to help his, girl, his girlfriend, went to help him. He punched her, kicked her, picked her up, held her over the banister on the fourth floor. She thought she was gonna be chucked down the stairs. Fortunately, she wasn't. He'd been violent to people in the church and to his uh, cousin at a family wedding. He never had any memory for these episodes and sometimes there was a, a lack of remorse. The case in question, he'd been staying with his 78-year-old mother. Last thing he can remember, she was ironing in the conservatory. He was watching a Grand Prix on television. The next thing he can remember, his mother's lying in a pool of blood in the hallway. He telephoned his aunt and then his sister. His aunt and neighbours came round. They thought he was quiet and withdrawn and assumed he was recovering from a seizure. He had no recall of the events and surprisingly it showed surprisingly little remorse. Mother died two days later of blows to the head and chest. Well, he was acquitted or found not guilty by reason of insanity and he ended up in a secure hospital. Roiber and Mackay reviewed all the cases of epilepsy giving rise to an insanity defence over a 25-year period. There were only 13 of them. Predominantly male, they have focal epilepsy, such as temporal lobe epilepsy. There's commonly psychiatric co comorbidity. Often they've been psychotic at the time or intoxicated at the time. They've often had some degree of neuropsychological impairment and they'd often had a previous conviction. The violence is often ferocious and the victim is very often a family member who's gone to help them following a seizure. So automatism, I've given you a pragmatic clinical definition. There are other definitions that exist in the clinical literature. The insane sane distinction is unsatisfactory, but it carries crucial implications.
there may be an interaction, this is rather interesting for a neuropsychiatrist, between the disease state, the seizure or hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and the pre-morbid psychiatric state. So you've got to have both for a violent automatism. Um, it remains a real but rare phenomenon. And you will know that the Law Commission made various proposals in 2013 replacing the idea of a medical automatism by the idea that someone would be found not criminally responsible by reason of a recognized medical condition if they wholly lacked these uh, capacities. Um, this is sort of bringing the rules into line with the current rules for diminished responsibility. Um, but I wonder if it throws the baby out with the bathwater, and in some ways the criteria are too broad. The more I think about this, um, the more I think it's rather good that these haven't been implemented, but we will, can discuss that later. Okay, amnesia and crimes of passion. This is a form of dissociative state, and it occurs in unpremeditated, unplanned homicide cases where there's often been extreme emotional arousal. The victim is usually someone close to the offender, a wife or lover. Uh, often the person has been clinically depressed. They may be or become suicidal and the amnesic gap ranges from a few minutes to an hour and it doesn't constitute grounds for a defense. Um, <clears throat> For example, a 67-year-old man battered his wife to death without any apparent motive. Subsequently, he telephoned the police and gave himself up. At the time, he claimed to have no memory of the actual attack, but recalled standing over the body, realizing that he had been responsible for his wife's death. Another case, a 40-year-old Egyptian married to an English woman with two children, discovered his wife was having an affair with a musician. He became depressed and was treated with an antidepressant. One afternoon he had a furious row with his wife during which he threatened to kill the musician. He could recall going to kiss his daughter goodnight but he could not recall anything after that until the police arrived. In the meantime he telephoned the police himself and he was subsequently charged with the murder of his wife by stabbing. Natalie Pizzora and I reviewed everybody given a life sentence in 1994. 29% of these cases had claimed amnesia, 31% of the homicide cases. We had data on what had happened at three-year follow-up. 2% said they had faked their amnesia and another 2% were thought to have faked their amnesia. Of the rest, a third had complete recovery of memory, a third had partial return of memory, and a third had no return of their memory. We also followed them up uh, after seven years when we found that symptoms of peritraumatic dissociation just before or after the amnesia were common in the amnesia group. Um, there was no difference in neuropsychological test scores or in measures of repression or PTSD in the amnesic as opposed to the no amnesia group. And the ones whose memory improved were the ones who had the longest amnesia in the first place or a past history of previous amnesic blackouts. Of course, the Crown, and actually many academic psychologists, argue that they're putting it off. They say, well, the, the psychologists say, the offender's amnesia doesn't resemble neurological amnesia. Well, is that important? Some offenders have been shown to fake amnesia. Well, fair enough. Alcoholics don't necessarily experience blackouts, that's a bit of a red herring. Asked to role play a police interview, many people claim amnesia, a bit of a red herring. Victims and eyewitnesses don't claim amnesia, well that's not actually true. Um, and they argue for symptom validity tests to check the validity of the amnesia, but these are actually very impractical in a prison setting. So the case against it all being simulation is you get a consistent story across many offenders. Their subjective accounts are rather similar to other people with psychologically based amnesias. They often give themselves up or report their own crime. The victims and eyewitnesses 
of offences can also show impaired recall and of course there's no legal advantage to having an amnesia except in the rare cases of sane automatism. In fact, being amnesic may be damaging to mounting your defence. So in summary, I've said that amnesia for offences occurs in automatism, occasionally in dementia, alcohol and substance misuse, occasionally in psychosis and in the crimes of passion. There's an issue about how we define automatism and about the sane-insane distinction. Uh, amnesia for crimes of passion arises in characteristic circumstances, but it remains controversial, and we don't really have appropriate symptom validity tests to check whether the amnesia is authentic or not. Thank you. Thank you. I, just, I thought I would just uh, produce a quick whiz through of some thoughts about uh, alcohol and homicide and some of the ways as a sort of practitioner, sort of thinking about it has changed over my career of doing uh, or being involved in homicides related to alcohol for about 20 years, I suppose. So I'm going to talk about some definitions, some statistics, and then some, some cases relating to, to case law. And I, I think... Um, you know, if Churchill may be right that he took more out of alcohol than alcohol took, uh, taken out of him, but unfortunately most uh, people with alcohol dependence syndrome don't uh, have that experience. We don't practice, psychiatrists don't practice psychiatry from these books hardly at all, except for when we're presented with them in the old Bailey and we're told that we have to. So, but I'm really putting them up now just to make the point that if we're talking about homicide, we're talking about you know, recognised medical conditions, etc., etc., those are the two... Um, those are the two main uh, psychiatric uh, classificatory systems, one from the States and one from, the UK, one from Europe, which you'll be familiar of, with. And there's more to alcohol than alcohol dependence. So uh, acute intoxication, simply in the context of alco alcohol, is, is just being drunk, it's drunkenness. But it's there, as a, as a, it's there in the book. And it's given rise to an interesting piece of case law uh, um, you know, in recent years, because, because there it is. I'm not going to read out the definition, simply to say that it, it, it's, it's a recognised medical condition. Harmful use is what most of us find ourselves doing occasionally, which is recognising that we're probably drinking a bit too much at different times, even though we know it's probably having a bit of a harmful uh, effect on, on our health. But again, it's there in, as a definition within the ICD-10. Psychotic disorder, is, I think, is really interesting because, um, and there's a, case, there's, there's a case which sort of touches on that, which I'm going to talk about, which if, 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 if you voluntarily intoxicate yourself, but actually you go mad, and then you commit an offence in the context of, you, of, of florid psychosis, um, do you have a defence? Um, uh, and I think that's sort of interesting, because I think from a psychiatric perspective, the etiology of your madness doesn't really matter. You, what you're presented with is somebody with you know, florid psychotic symptoms that could help to explain their behaviour. But I think the courts see that sort of slightly differently. But there we are. Anyway, psychotic disorder, you know, another manifestation can be of alcohol. Alcoholic hallucinosis is something that we recognise fairly clearly. But obviously other drugs uh, have more florid effects in terms of causing psychosis. But where it's really at is alcohol dependence. And I still have colleagues, one in particular who will remain nameless, who's prepared to give evidence that alcohol dependence isn't a disease. That it's a, it's a lifestyle choice. That it's a habit that it's something that you, you, know, you can turn on and off depending upon the situation. The original definition of alcohol dependence was from uh, Griffith Edwards' uh, paper in, in the British Medical Journal in 1976, and all of our thinking really about alcohol dependence has, flown, has, has flowed from that. And the key elements of alcohol dependence that Griffith Edwards wrote about was narrowing of repertoire, so you drink the same stuff on the same day at the same time, salience of drinking, drinking becomes the thing that you do over and above everything else, you become increasingly tolerant, you get withdrawal symptoms if you stop, you drink in order to stop having withdrawal symptoms, so you have hair of the dog or you have a drink first thing in the morning to try and get over it, and you get back into, if you have a period of abstinence, you, you want to drink again as soon as you start again, you suddenly find yourself having a kind of compulsion. And that becomes, I think, interesting because um, I think most psychiatrists would argue that alcohol the people who are alcohol dependent can have periods of abstinence. I mean, AA would not exist if it weren't for the fact that people with alcohol dependence can be abstinent for periods. Um, 
but when they start drinking again, they rapidly come back into the situation or re-enter the situation psychologically and physiologically that they were in when they were drinking heavily before. And those are described by a dependent syndrome in the ICD-10, which is very broadly the same as, as the kind of Griffith Edward model. DSM-4 now talks about alcohol use disorder. The, 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 the DSM, DSM-5 rather talks about alcohol use disorder. You used to talk about sort of problematic alcohol use and then alcohol dependence, and they've merged the two together now. So depending upon how many of those, there are six on that slide and another 11, how many of those factors you have, it depend, it will, will, will sort of place you more or less up the sort of scale. So if you, there's this comparison between DSM-4 and DSM-5. So essentially the idea that the presence of two indicates an alcohol use disorder of those kind of criteria, and then three, uh, mild, four, moderate, and then severe, the presence of sort of six or more symptoms. So I'm not sure that actually works very well in, in clinical practice because I think some of those symptoms trump other ones. So it's not simply a question of adding on symptoms to, to you know, measure severity. It can be the individuals score relatively low in terms of symptoms, but the symptoms they do have, or the problems they do have, are, are very significant. But anyway, there we are, that's a kind of the way that, I think it's worth probably saying that, of course, the DSM-5, the ICD-10, these are diagnoses by committee. This is a group of people sitting in a room, deciding what the diagnosis is. And that may be helpful, but it's, it's not necessarily helpful, uh, you know, across the board. There are certainly conditions that you encounter regularly in clinical practice, I've just been involved in a case where a big argument about whether chronic mania still exists. It's not in the books anymore, but most psychiatrists will encounter, have encountered people who were chronically hypermanic or chronically elated over a long period of time who got some treatment and got better. But, you know, it's not in the book, so what does that, what does that mean? Simple, there are some simple measure, ways of measuring uh, you know, or screening for alcohol. This is the cage. Um, uh, and there's simply four questions, the sort of thing that people, the general practitioners use. Have you ever felt you should cut down on your drinking, that's the C? Have people annoyed you by criticising your drinking, that's the A? Have you ever felt guilty about your drinking? Have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning as an eye opener? I think I score sort of between one and two most of the time, um, occasionally. Not, not often three, but occasionally one or two. And uh, the, the notion is that uh, the score of four is virtually diagnostic of alcoholism. Okay. So. That's some of, that's the way that if a psychiatrist when thinking about alcohol and structuring thinking about diagnosis will sort of deal with it. And just thinking about the nature of the problem in the community, I thought it might just be useful to think about. So these are broad, uh, th th these are broad alcohol measures, okay, but using broad alcohol measures, there are, there are about a million estimated admissions related to alcohol in, uh, per year in the UK, hospital admissions. Uh, 33% more than 2014 and nearly double what it was about 10, 10 years ago, although the measure, the, the way the, the recordings changed. Two thirds uh, men, a third women, um, and nearly about half are, are, are elderly, 44% uh, you know, patients between 55 and 74. So UK alcohol consumption is higher than the average for all OECD countries. It has decreased, but we're, we're right up there. I mean. You know, countries like kind of Lithuania and Estonia, uh, those, those traditional very heavy drinking countries where only recently I've discovered that Russia decided that beer is alcohol. <laughs> it's only been in the last few years that, been, that, that for legal purposes that beer, beer constitutes alcohol. Because, you know, why would you worry about beer when you're drinking 40, 50, 60 proof uh, vodka? Um, so there we are, we're somewhere in the, in the middle. Um, but this is really striking, I mean, in the context of the nature of the problem, and we do have, we have an epidemic uh, of alcohol uh, in, in Western Europe, and we really, we really do. Uh, and so, the way, the algorithms that are used to construct this, this uh, data are quite robust, but you, you've got to remember, of course, there's an awful lot of hidden alcoholism that never comes anywhere near services. People are, you know, so-called high-functioning alcoholics, people who are suffering really from alcohol dependence, but don't, for whatever reason, end up in services. But as an estimate, really, that uh, you know, this is uh, about 200,000, 220,000 men in the UK between 35 and 54 have got alcohol dependence. So we're not talking about harmful use or uh, acute intoxication. We're talking about people with a dependence syndrome, and you know, about 50,000 of those have got children in the household. The, the, the alcohol is a very pervasive, uh, uh, damaging uh, drug across the board. Uh, in, in, interestingly, always men more than women, uh, and but the, that, that sort of peak age for both men and women is that sort of 
mid 40s, mid 50s, um, alcohol, alcohol, you know, if it's going to become a problem, does become a problem. Okay, so just thinking about some cases, I mean, you, you know about these better than me, but um, when I started doing this work, I hadn't really heard of Gittins, um, um, uh, and it's only re more recently that I've realised that sort of we've gone right round in a circle, really. Um, so Gittins, a depression, alcohol problems, on daily defence he consumed alcohol and then killed his wife with a hammer. He then raped and killed his stepdaughter, thinking her to be his wife, which is interesting and has some resonance with the notions about automatism and, uh, well, you know, if that's really true, if the court accepts that that's really the case, then what kind of mental state would he have been in to have got to that point? There was lots of conflicting psychiatric evidence, there always is, um, uh, various people saying various things. The judge directed the jury that when considering the effects of alcohol and drugs on the one hand and inherent causes such as depression, they must decide which factor was the substantial cause of the conduct. Then only if the inherent causes were the major factor would diminish be established. So it, the, 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 you know, the non-alcohol causes had to be the major factor. The appeal court realised that if a situation occurred when both inherent causes on the one hand and alcohol and drugs on the other separately reached the threshold needed to substantially impair responsibility, then that direction might cause the effects, the, the, the effects of the inherent causes to be ignored. And they judged that the jury should be directed to disregard what in their view was the effect of the alcohol or the drugs on the defendant, the abnormality of mind. So, um, because that... It, because that wouldn't be within the section, but then to consider whether the combined effect of the other matters did fall within the section. And my reading of that is it looks quite cl quite similar to sort of Deitchman that came along a bit later on. I mean, I may be wrong, and you can correct me, but I mean, I was brought up with this. Um, you know, I was told that that was the law when I was uh, when I was training, and you know, Tandy is impossible. Tandy doesn't amount to any recognised uh, mental state that I think uh, we would we would see in reality. <laughs> So Linda Tandy, she has chronic alcohol uh, uh, misuse, she normally consumed vermouth, but on the day of the offence she drank nine tenths of a bottle of vodka. She lived with her second husband with the two children from her first marriage. Evidence presented at trial suggests she had a good relationship with her daughter. On the day of the killing, her daughter returned home late, asked her mother if she could go and live with her grandmother, saying that she had been sexually interfered with. And when intoxicated, uh, Tandy strangled her daughter with a scarf and then later claimed amnesia for the offence. And her blood alcohol taken shortly after the offence was about three times the UK drink drive limit. And at the trial, th there's this notion that the, the jury felt to have an abnormality of mind arising as a result of the disease of alcohol, and she must have no immediate control over her drinking. If the taking of the first drink of the day was not involuntary, then the whole of the drinking that day was not involuntary, and so she was convicted of murder. And the appeal court really upheld that. Uh, Experience, those experiencing alcohol misuse are capable of choice, choose their condition and associated consequences. And from, I think from a medical perspective, the fact that she drank vodka instead of vermouth and didn't finish the bottle would be irrelevant. But for the court, that was highly relevant and seemed to be highly suggestive of her being able to exercise some control. Um, they did accept that it could give rise to diminished responsibility in certain circumstances. But the argument was, you know, an abnormality of mind must be in present, induced by disease of alcoholism, which substantially impaired responsibility. And for alcohol dependence syndrome to amount to an abnormality of mind, it must have reached the level at which the brain has been injured. Or, in cases where there hasn't been brain damage, it, it, drinking must have been involunt involuntary, which describes occurring when an individual is no longer able to resist the impulse to drink. And of course, the argument is that if you hold a, if you hold a gun, to our head, to, to your, to your, you know, my, uh, the patient's head doctor, and said, if you take a drink, I'll, I'll shoot you. And they still, and they, of course, they won't take a drink. But that's not a measure of anything. That doesn't, that doesn't bear up to sort of physiological or psychiatric reality. She committed suicide uh, in uh, shortly after her appeal was rejected at HMP Durham, and her blood alcohol level, when it was when measured after she, uh, at her post mortem, was roughly the same as it had been at the time of her offence. Interestingly. So she'd continued to drink in prison, and then after her pill was rejected, hung herself. But then, moving on, so the Deitchman occurred. Uh, so this man had a relationship with his aunt, and when she died, he experienced a grief reaction, a possible alcohol dependence. I mean, everybody that I see with, who's got clinical alcohol dependence also has an affective disorder. So it's a, in a way, it's useful, but it's sort of also a red herring. Nearly everybody's got a depressive illness or some other, you know, or an anxiety disorder because uh, the two, alcohol is such a powerful depressant that if you're a chronic uh, uh, drinker, it's almost, you're, you're, you're taking a depressant agent all the time. So no wonder your mood's depressed. 
the appeal court judged the appeal court initially judged that for diminished responsibility to be established the defence must prove on the balance of probability that if he had not taken alcohol the killing would still have occurred and he would still have met the requirements for diminished and that was in conflict with the judgment in Gittins I think and then the House of Lords overturned that um, essentially saying that you could take a component of voluntary drinking still permits the defence of diminished and you can take away the alcohol. It used to be that I was told that if, if, if alcohol's occurred, if drunkenness is there, then there is no defence, come what may, irrespective of what else might be happening in that person's mental state. And Deichmann has sort of opened the door, I think, into thinking that, well, actually, you can separate these out. It's ridiculous to talk about the notion of, uh, you know, uh, if there's somebody's got another pre-existing condition, you can't separate those out. And then things have moved on a bit. I mean, it, it, this is a uh, RV Stewart. Um, the court in this case correctly identified that it'd be an unreasonable task to try and separate what might appear to be voluntary drinking from the dependence underlying condition of dependence. Because a lot is made of the idea well, if you get up to your normal threshold, then that's your dependence syndrome kicking in. And then if you choose to drink more, that's a voluntary decision that you've decided <coughs> to drink more. Do you see the, do you see the argument? You know the argument better than me. Which, again, from a sort of psychiatric perspective, is sort of nonsense. So, establishing the presence of an abnormality of mind depends on the nature and extent of the alcohol dependence syndrome, broadly whether consumption of alcohol before the killing was fairly to be regarded as the involuntary result of an irresistible craving or compulsion. And when deciding on substantial impairment, they've got to think about the, the extent and the seriousness of the dependency, the extent to which ability to control drinking or choose whether to drink or not was reduced, whether there was some capability for abstinence. Um, <laughs> But notwithstanding his consumption, his ability to make, if any, to make apparently sensible and rational decisions. Wood is a, another case, um, a man who, with alcohol dependent syndrome, uh, killed the victim by striking him with a meat cleaver after he woke to find him trying to perform oral sex on him. Um, I, that, again, was seen to be a sort of misdirection in the direction of Tandy. Um, And the idea being really that succumbing to a craving will depend on the strength of the craving and the dependent's capacity to address and overcome it. I won't read the rest of the, uh, of the, the judgment in Wood. Oh, I think Downs is interesting because th this was a case where um, uh, I mentioned to you before acute intoxication being in the book. So somebody attempted to run diminished based on acute intoxication as being a recognised medical condition. And the, the Court of Appeal were not having that um, as a... a, a uh, the idea that voluntary temporary drunkenness would be capable of founding a defence of diminished was not accepted. The exception which prevents a defendant from relying on his involuntary intoxication, save upon the limited question of whether a specific intent has been formed, is well entrenched. Uh, it is quite clear that the reformulation of the statutory conditions for diminished was not intended to reverse the well-established rule that voluntary and acute intoxication is not capable of being relied upon. That remains the law. The presence of a recognised medical condition is a necessary but not always a sufficient condition to raise the issue. So, you know, that's, it's, it, it's interesting. A couple of others. Um, I thought the case of Williams is interesting because I, I think I know all of the psychiatrists who are involved and that was a case where fresh evidence of alcohol dependence was accepted by the Court of Appeal later. Um, it, despite the, having been psychiatric evidence to begin with that, 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 that alcohol dependence wasn't an issue, it was very clear that it was, and the original psychiatrist had missed it, essentially, um, and was heavily criticised um, because of that. And then there are a couple of others, Bunch and Lind Lindo is interesting, There's the two colleague, well, one colleague of Michael's, um, uh, Richard Latham, and another colleague of ours, Ian Cumming, uh, arguing about whether somebody has, is somebody in an acute prodrome prior to having developing schizophrenia? So it raises an interesting question, when does a, when does a prodrome, or or early symptoms of schizophrenia become diagnosable schizophrenia and an argument about drug-induced psychosis whether or not drug-induced drug -induced psychosis would amount to uh, a recognised medical condition. I, mean, I can't see why it shouldn't but it goes back to this question about if your original use of the drug or the alcohol was voluntary and you don't have alcohol dependence then can you rely on the fact that you've taken something that sent you mad as a defence? Um, I'm not going to go through those. I'm just going to mention one case very briefly. That's just somebody that I see, so I'm conscious of the time. This is somebody you saw years ago. Uh, 
A police called to an address in Tottenham, a man with a wound to his neck, m massive blood loss, died in the ambulance whilst at the scene, victim local street drinker. Witnesses describe seeing an argument break out during which uh, the, the, um, our, our, uh, the defendant was seen to strike the victim on the neck whilst brandishing a knife. Lots of drinking, um, not clear what any argument would have been about, but it, it, it was noted that he struck the victim in the neck and then walked off. He, all the police said he was heavily intoxicated, unstable on his feet, slurred speech, strong smell of intoxicating liquor. Um, he attempted to comment when he was arrested, but his speech was slurred. He was detained. He, de he, he said he didn't need a solicitor because he hadn't done anything wrong. Um, he couldn't remember having done anything. Uh, he, he, you know, the custody sergeant's reason given for not signing his records is incapable. Uh, he, he, he gave a good, good account of alcohol dependence in terms of his consumption of alcohol, but said he wasn't dependent. The custody officer noted he was heavily intoxicated, under the of alcohol, heavily intoxicated, speech slurred, unsteady on feet. FME thought he was fit to be detained, but he needed to be roused every 30 minutes because they were concerned that he might go into a coma. Um, and uh, he, I, 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 it seemed to me that he was incapable of forming an intent. And that was ultimately accepted, that he actually, one of those sort of rare ones where he was so drunk, he was literally falling down drunk. Um, there, was good sort of, uh, there was good evidence of a man who just could not, um, uh, he, he couldn't give an explanation of why he'd done this. Um, and he had complete amnesia and was so drunk as to, you know, be able, be able to form an intent. Anyway, that's a quick whisper from me. Of doctors and medicines, we have in plenty more than enough. What you may, for the love of God, send is some large quantities of beer <laughs> from the colony of New South Wales in 1850. Thank you. Scroll down, thank you. <coughs> Great. Um, well, this evening I hope to cover with you really five um, areas to do with litigating complex forensic psychiatric cases. My focus tonight will not be on principles of criminal evidence or um, particularly anything to do with the law, it will be instead how these cases, these complex forensic psychiatric cases, can be financially rewarding as well as forensically rewarding. Um, so I hope that uh, you might take away some benefit from um, these five points. And I'll go through them in detail in just a moment, but in headlines uh, they are. The first, how you can use to your very liberation defending, um, and so really up on the wrong side of the courtroom, um, the court's duty of proactive case management and we'll look and see how a practical example of that is to do with how you can get a better, you can make an application for and get a better level of representation at the bar to counsel or junior counsel plus so. Uh, the second is pages of prosecution evidence. It is, as we know, the absolute bane of our life, PPE and the idea that we are reliant on the CPS to tell us what the status of the evidence is so that we can bill for it. Um, and so what I'll be looking at with you shortly is how you can use the LAA's own word, deemed, um, to deem and invite a Crown Court judge to agree that he so deems too, um, that the pages of prosecution evidence uh, were not the 14 witness statements and the 100 or so exhibits, but that they were instead um, the medical records on which people had to prepare for cross-examination and examination chief re-examination witnesses, um, and that they were hospital records, um, prison inmate records, etc. That that in fact is the evidence in the case. And after that deemed day of trial, what none of us wants to do, but tends to happen all the more, is to attend and be ready for a trial, and then the court not be able to accommodate us for a trial, and so spend one day there, two days, three days, sorting out disclosure, etc., and not being paid anything but a mention fee. And so again, using the language of the LAA, you can invite a Crown Court judge to deem when he thinks day one of the trial was. 
and most judges are on side and will be ready to deem that day one was when court serve said the case would be convened for trial. Um, after that, you'll get this handout via email, so I won't go through with you steps for preparation re-application for a witness summons. Um, but I will, after that, cover off this uh, fifth point, but a fourth point for this evening, the Criminal Bar Association's protocol um, in respect of a judicial hotline. And in short, the hotline is a real gift. Um, the hotline uh, allows you to say to a judge via email, copied into the other side, judge, please help me cut through this administrative bog that I have to wade through when dealing with the LAA because the LAA has asked me for further information about the expert and I'm quite satisfied I've given all relevant information that the LAA could possibly require um, or else the LAA has queried why I've chosen that expert, not one resident in London, etc. Um, so I'll give you a practical example of that in just a minute. Okay, perhaps if we could um, move to, if we just scroll down to judicial proactivity. The first part of that really just covers off when um, uh, the idea of the adversarial and the partisan gave way to and conceded ground to um, something radically different, fairness between the parties. Um, and so the point here is uh, and my leader is sitting at the back of the room, Emma Goodall, at Doughty Street Chambers. Emma and I were instructed in a case together earlier this year, March or so, uh, in which the defendant had um, various recognised mental illnesses. And in short, um, even if there was not a psychiatric element present, um, he needed further and better assistance at court. It was arguable than a single counsel. And so the art here, as you can read at your leisure in the handout, but the short point is, was that um, the defence took the view uh, that um, an intermediary had been instructed um, at the request of the court, and the defence took the view that the intermediary was a really good lever to see whether the intermediary's view and the um, instructed psychologist's view was that two counsel were what would be the appropriate special measure for this defendant. Um, and in the event, uh, an intermediary was not required, but rather um, the view of the expert was that um, two counsel were appropriate. And in the event, that was put before um, Crown Court judge, and the judge agreed. So use um, the order of the court that an intermediary is um, commissioned to your advantage. And the intermediary's report is a good basis or launch pad um, from which for you to invite um, whichever expert you think appropriate, psychologist or psychiatrist, to take a view on what is the appropriate special measure. Level and type of representation at the bar is a particular type of special measure. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, and if we can go through to, oh, and the, perhaps I should just say, um, gloriously, he was acquitted of all counts. Uh, after trial, historic buggery, seven day trial. Um, great work, Emma. Uh, right, so the second, second um, point is uh, this deemed service of case. Service of case, of course, is service of the prosecution's case on which they rely to prove an element or elements of the offence or offences against you. Um, Service of case has a particular meaning for you as litigators and us as counsel because um, the Crown is, uh, well, as we know, not generous in its description of what is service of case. It's very slow to deem what is service of case. And in short, um, it's not a happy experience to wait around to put in your bill for work you've done and to chance it before a costs judge. So you can and you should be proactive. Um, you can read this at your leisure, but again, just taking the short point, um, this time, uh, another leader, Joe Stone, Queen's Council, sitting at the back of the room. Um, Joe Stone and I had a case earlier this year, uh, again, acquitted on all fronts, strangulation of a jailer. Um, and there, a complex forensic psychiatric case in which the served case was really pretty light and slim, um, perhaps 100 pages or so. That, that is the witness statements and the exhibits on which the Crown sought to prove its case. But the evidence in the case, really without which the case couldn't have got off the ground meaningfully so, 
um, whereby the all, all reasonable avenues of inquiry of witnesses would be made and a conviction if it was to be returned by the jury would be a safe one. The evidence in the case really in reality was the hospital records, the GP primary health care records, the prison inmate records, um, hundreds of pages uh, uh, totaling over a, a thousand or so um, from Broadmoor Hospital. Uh, and so what we invited the judge to do was to use this language of the LAA deem, and we invited the judge to deem and to observe on the darts recording, and for good measure we asked the clerk to print it, she did, we submitted it with our bill, um, that the evidence in the case the judge was satisfied was as we presented. Um, so of course that made a radically different um, position for us and for our instructing solicitors when it came to billing the case. Um, and the way that we did that, the last point, to make it as simple for the judge as possible was we set it out in the form of a short application, a page and a half or so, uh, and we handed up to the judge, tabulated every page of what we had read. And the reality is everything was relevant because everything was relevant for the prosecution to read. They'd either got it and put it before the court pursuant to a witness summons, or we had. Um, and it, it did all have to be read, is the absolute reality. Um, you couldn't assess any of these witnesses who had had contact with this vulnerable defendant, um, this prisoner. You just couldn't assess their evidence based on their single or two-page statement. That just wasn't the reality of that witness. That witness had a backstory with the defendant. And that backstory was these hospital records um, and his hundreds of pages from Broadmoor. Uh, and because it was so simple, and, and well presented, the judge, we were pushing against the open door and he had no persuasion at all. And um, the judge asked if he read that particular uh, wording, would it help before the LAA? And we said it very much assist the LAA. And so the judge did. Um, so we can take the uh, next point now. I think um, much more shortly, it is deemed day one of trial. Um, so in fact, we can use this to show it. This was a note for taxation prepared in that case I mentioned. Um, and if we scroll down, uh, we'll just go to yeah, deemed day one of trial. So the short point is we got to court on the Monday. Court serve said that we were to be convened for trial on the Monday. We were not effective for various reasons. Day number two, not effective. Day number three, and this was all to, to do with prison production failures, disclosure, um, remaining outstanding, the court couldn't accommodate us, all the usual things that we are met with every day. Um, and on day four or so, we were ready, and we were ready to impanel a jury. And so as far as the LAA would be concerned, that was day one of the trial. But, um, instead, the judge agreed with us that um, on the first day convened, the Monday, uh, it represented the, the first day of trial. Um, and he was so satisfied, not because we'd put before him a legal argument, or he was so satisfied because we had been ready, he'd seen the work that had been done, and he was ready to throw out the LAA, their very own language. Uh, so this, was, this note for taxation um, might help you to see how you can present to the LAA uh, really the reality of what happened and um, so that you can present to them why they are reading a transcript with the judge saying all of this stuff about deemed, read PPE and days uh, of trial. Okay, so we can skate through that, that last page too. <coughs> um, application for a witness summons, uh, there it is. Our fourth point, um, so you can read about that in your own time, um, but Joe Stone and I from that case uh, can tell you all about it, and in terms of is it really third party material, etc, etc. Um, so you can have a look at it there and get in touch if you'd like to learn anything more about that. So the fifth point is this, perhaps this will be the most useful single thing from this evening. It is dealing with the LAA. Um, we, we are not uh, the Crown, and so we don't have to um, simply rest on the fact that an advice from counsel is sufficient to, rep to instruct an expert. Instead, um, it's for you as litigators and you as counsel to seek to um, try and crowbar your way into um, one of the, um, the, the criteria for the LAA, whether it's an exceptional expert, whether it's an expert resident in London, out of London, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, so a good way to do this is the, this judicial hotline, uh, it, it's great. Crown Court judges embrace it. Um, the 
CBA, Criminal Bar Association, set it up, I think, about 18 months ago or so. It's not very much used. It does still exist, and it should be used, because it is, for us, um, so very useful. And if we just scroll down, what we did in this trial, um, Joe's idea was, let's send to the judge on email what this hotline is, and let's invite the judge to ring up the hotline himself and to say who he is and that he's sitting at the Blackfriars Crown Court and that he hopes and expects to hear a trial that should be ready in you know, three weeks' time and that he would be very disappointed if he were instead hearing endless mentions, re, um, non-readiness, etc. Um, so you can see here um, what was provided, copied to the prosecution, copied to HMCTS, etc., um, and it, the judge wrote at the request of the defence, I've been asked to see uh, whether an application for prior authority for an expert's report can be expedited. Um, the defence are trying to obtain a psychiatric report and serve it by 12th of December last year. Defendant is an inpatient in Broadmoor and a conference is booked for his examination. The only issue uh, looking at the correspondence appears to be the agreed rate of funding, something with which we are so familiar. The timetable is fairly tight. That was, I'm afraid, judicial moderation and utter understatement. Because the defendant is subject to custody time limits and his trial is coming up towards the beginning of next year. Um, so could prior authority be granted on your standard rate? It wasn't answered um, the next day, but if it wasn't the next day, it was the, the day after that. And the judge immediately let us know, the Crown know, um, and it, not least, perhaps, this judge was user-friendly on email. But if your judge isn't, or if your case isn't reserved to a judge, then make it the um, delight of the resident judge at your court centre to help you to deal with this. And then suddenly it's not you applying before the court to say, can I tell you why we've made all efforts to be ready, but I have to make this an enviable application. It's instead you saying to the judge, I'd like to lock horns with you, try and deal with these really unreasonable people, the LAA. So five um, very practical points for you, and you can read in detail in the uh, five or so page handout um, that I think um, Eileen will send to you at the end of the seminar. Thank you very much for coming to Doughty Street. Right, you've all been listening for quite a long time now. Stand up. Everyone stand up. <laughs> right? You've all had long days, you've all been in court, you've all been heads in, buried in legal documents. We're going to count. We're going to go right round to the end of the room. We're going to go along the first row and back round the first. The experts don't have to do this. So we all number one. We go right to the top and then count back down, back to one, and see if we can get back to one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the same number going up and going down, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about the research that we've been doing at Leicester on stabbing. We also work on dismemberment, but really we're looking at weapons, uh, manufactured tools, and how they interact with, with people. So if you could, uh, next slide please. Oh, is it here? Okay. 
so knife crime is the biggest, um, the, the, the highest way in which um, people are killed in the UK. Um, actually, the number of deaths from uh, murders has gone down over the last 10, 11 years, um, largely because emergency medicine has improved so much, um, not necessarily because the number of incidents has gone down. But um, these are uh, some examples of the implements that the Metropolitan Police uh, regularly collect. Um, some of them obviously um, designed as instruments for, for not necessarily kitchen or uh, domestic use but more cutting and uh, um, other uses but actually in most crime the um, kitchen knife is the most common implement. It's widely available and um, we've had two talks today where um, the weapon of resort has been a cleaver or a knife for, for killing people and it's because they're convenient, they're to hand, they're readily available, they're easily purchased and they're readily disposable. So those are the sorts of things that we look at most. and. Um, We've been looking a lot into stabbing. So stabbing is defined as a cut where the depth into the body is much greater than the depth of the wound or the length of the wound on the body. Um, and slashing is um, the opposite where the depth is small but the, the length is wide. The most common thing we see are kitchen carbon knives. You also see sheath knives, folding knives, um, scissors, uh, chisels. Um, Samurai swords, particularly in certain areas of the community, they have um, racks of these weapons on their walls uh, to show how hard they are. And then uh, when uh, something kicks off, they take it and use it in a way in which it wasn't intended to be used. Uh, but we also see things like um, uh, kukri, cell makers, and glass bottles and fragments, which are used um, in, in these stabbing incidents. So the key questions in court are how much force was used and how sharp was the knife or the implement and we've been looking at that over about 10-15 years now. Um, so the factors that affect how much force was required are the knife characteristics, the mechanics of the stabbing action. Um, you said that I was an expert in uh, biomechanics, not of amnesia but more of uh, stabbing. Um, victim related factors, so age bears a difference. Um, the mechanical properties of the skin change as, as we age. Um, things like level of hydration also affect the elasticity of the skin. And the sorts of things, the clothing that people are wearing, um, whether or not they've just got a t-shirt on, whether or not they've got multiple layers of clothing. Um, you can actually buy yourself on the internet a slash hoodie. So you can go to drink in a pub with a very nice hoodie that's reinforced with Kevlar. Or perhaps you can change where you drink. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an alternative uh, approach to that. Now, most items of clothing are easily penetrated by a sharp knife. Apart from leather, denim gives you a bit more protection. Um, but leather of all of the things that uh, protect you is, is the most effective. And pathologists would usually characterise the force that's required um, to produce an incised wound as, as slight, slight pressure, moderate force or severe force. And Bernard Knight in 1972 said that the estimation of force is almost impossible to answer with any degree of objectivity. Um, we've come a long way since then. We know an awful lot more about the forces that are involved, but it's still an incredibly difficult um, question. One of the challenges is that different stabbing actions can produce the same injury or the same wound on the body. So this shows you two people here. One is uh, an overhand stab um, with the implement going down into the victim's body um, with the victim stood up. Um, the other is just a, a thrust um, where the victim is leaning slightly towards uh, the person stabbing. And both of those would give exactly the same wound track on, on the body and so that makes it complex to take a wound on a, on a victim and then interpret that into the relative positions of the two people involved in the stabbing incident. So if you have um, witness evidence that tells you how those people were standing in relation to each other that helps but very often in a stabbing incident what you've got is um, the person who inflicted the stab and the deceased and it's very difficult to just reconstruct how the, how the stab was inflicted from that. So 
In terms of biomechanics, um, we know the speed at which um, people typically stab, and it depends to some extent on um, the way in which they're stabbing. So a long over is an overhand stab, um, where somebody's stepping into it, so they're coming from some distance away from uh, the person that uh, they're stabbing. Uh, a long under would be where somebody's stepping in with much more of an under, under thrust, um, and a short over is where the two people are very close together and you've got uh, either a, a stabbing over or a stabbing uh, under. Doesn't vary greatly. Somewhere between about six and um, 12 meters per second. Now when you compare that to ballistic velocities, which can be anything from 150 to 300 meters per second, it's a very slow action, but it is still a dynamic action. So um, we know that um, the dynamics are important and they will change what you see. Now how much force do you need? Well, of your tissues, the skin is the thing that um, requires the most force to penetrate. And that um, is much more than the muscle or fat. Now that's not saying that you don't have to keep applying force to the weapon to drive it through muscle and fat, but just that the resistance that those two tissues give to the stab is much less. And quite often you'll hear in a stabbing incident people saying that uh, once the skin has been penetrated, the knife appears to fall into the, into the soft tissues. That's not strictly true, it doesn't fall, but it does go in an awful lot more easily, more readily, once the skin has been penetrated. And if you've got a sharp knife, it typically takes somewhere between 35 and 55 newtons of force to penetrate the body. Um, that's one of those um, technical terms that you were saying about not using, but uh, a newton is uh, 100 gram apple falling from a tree that's the typical force or if you take 10 newtons it's about the force of uh, dropping a bag of sugar on your foot okay so that gives you um, a, an idea of what we're talking about in terms of level of force so why is stabbing so dangerous well this is some data that was obtained um, when the metropolitan police were looking at um, defining standards for body armor what they did was they took a whole range of people and put them through CT scanners and this shows the CT of a body and um, if you put a needle through from front to back actually um, you know most people the depth front to back is not that great um, it varies a little bit um, but you can take on average uh, a value and what they were doing for the design of the body armor and so looking at whether or not it was acceptable for a knife to penetrate the body by 20 millimeters or whether it was okay for it to penetrate the body by 40 millimeters now with 20 millimeters of knife penetration in 41 percent of cases it would breach the pleura of the lungs the lining of the lungs in 61 percent to just two centimeters of penetration would be sufficient to penetrate the liver uh, 64 percent of cases it's sufficient to penetrate femoral, femoral arteries and 25 percent of cases um, you can penetrate spleens but in six percent of cases just 20 millimeters of penetration is enough to stab into the heart so that's why stabbing is so dangerous and leads to death in so many cases because depending on where the victim is stabbed on the body you can penetrate and damage significant organs so what we've been doing is we've been doing some work with a dynamometer. Now a dynamometer is a big force plate. Um, this has on it um, a skin simulant that we use, which is a silicone rubber and a foam analog. It also has the yellow layer is a big thick um, rubber backing, and that's to stop the knife so that we don't snap the knives and uh, damage the people who are involved in our trials. So this has got piezoelectric load cells behind it which allows us to measure how much force is generated and if I move on here um, we can just show you this video. So this is the sort of test that we've been doing. This is one of our students who can stab into the dynamometer. We can record the peak force that that person stabbing generates as they do that. So we can 
get data for many different situations with many different implements and we've looked at many different types of volunteers so we've had um, both men and women with um, different um, different body shapes different athletic ability um, we just took a random um, sample of our students to do that and um, we got them also to do some common actions so we weren't just getting them to do stabbing we wanted to be able to compare it to everyday actions because one of the things you quite often ask in court is well you know does that equate to a hard punch or does it equate to a slap you know when you say a significant force what is that so we measured some forces for some everyday actions now on the bottom of this graph here it says non-dom and dom so if you're right-handed your dominant hand is your right hand and your non-dominant hand is your left hand um, it's separated out by gender and we did uh, button push <coughs> punch push uh, a slap um, and a push with both hands so those are the typical forces that we generate you can see that um, for men with their dominant hand does this work this laser pointer so men with their dominant hand the peak force is up at 800 newtons with their non-dominant hand it's about 600 and then for women um, much less down at 300 with a dominant hand and about 240 with their non-dominant hand so those forces um, that they can generate with punching are very significant um, pushes are um, down at the bottom here um, typically with a push somewhere between 100 180 for men uh, about 80 and 100 for women um, slaps are more significant again 300 and 450 for men and over 200 for women interestingly women slap equally well with both hands <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's some fascinating things that come out of this data um, so that's the everyday actions um, how does that equate to stabbing so we did a um, number of stabs with um, a chisel screwdriver so that's um, the one that with just the flat um, blade a Phillips screwdriver um, which is the one with the star type um, screw that you would use a sabatier knife which was a sharp sabatier knife and a steak knife and we chose sabatier knife and steak knife because they're quite common um, with um, the um, sorts of implements that you see in crime so the forces here the scales changed but what you see is typically with uh, the knives with the dominant hand the men are getting up to about 200 newtons um, the women it's about half that it's about 100 newtons so generating significant forces with that stabbing action but that stabbing action doesn't equate to a punch and it doesn't equate to a push particularly um, it's very difficult to take the forces that people generate with the knives and relate them to the forces that they generate with other everyday actions um, this is um, looking at the same results for pork leg and you can see that the level of forces that we're generating are roughly the same stabbing into a pork leg um, we also stabbed into pork ribs um, again because quite often you ask you know lots of stabs are in the chest area so quite often we're asked about how it changes if it's the ribs generating largely the same sorts of forces here between pork leg and pork rib um, and we've got um, the similar characteristics of um, the level of mean force being roughly half that from women to men and then this is much more complex um, so just bear with me a bit here what we asked people to do was we asked them to try and stab with the forces that the colleges use so if you remember at the beginning we had that slight pressure mild moderate severe forces and we asked people to stab with what they felt was a mild force what they felt 
was a medium force and what they felt was a sphere force. So we didn't give them any direction other than to say try and stab with those particular parameters. And when you look at this, um, there's some interesting things. There's clear differentiation between severe and moderate and mild, but there's not that much differentiation between mild and moderate. It's difficult for people to um, guess what the difference between mild and moderate is. But they, um, when they're asked to use their maximum force, the severe force, they can all generate something much more significant. Um, but largely the forces, the peak forces, um, with the severe stab are at the 200 Newton level for men and about the 100 Newton level for women, so roughly half the force. So what this is showing is that people can't really distinguish between mild and moderate. Um, they can um, possibly distinguish between severe, but you'll see that there's also some overlap in the data here. So this concept of mild, moderate, severe is very difficult um, for people to actually stab with. Um, and what this, what this suggests is that that mild, moderate, severe scale is not that helpful. Um, and so that's the results that we've obtained with our dynamometer. There's, um, the thesis of Gary Nolan has got all the underlying statistics with this and the statistical analysis, but I thought I didn't want to make your brains ache at seven o'clock <laughs> on an evening with lots of statistics. So if I just zip through the conclusions of the work, men generate typically twice as much force as women when stabbing. Uh, in the majority of cases, people can generate higher forces with their dominant hand. Um, Forces generated in actions which would be considered blunt force trauma, so the punch, the slap, are higher than that generated in a stabbing. Um, punches generate almost double the force of a stab. Um, and the interesting thing in court here is that the same rating system is used by pathologists in court, this mild, moderate, severe thing, for both blunt and sharp force injuries. Um, but they're not comparable with the data that we've got. Um, the force generated in stabbing events is higher than that required for penetration of the skin. Even with a mild stab, it's higher than the force gen needed for penetration. With a sharp knife, okay, so this is data for sharp knives here, and our sharp knife penetrate between 35 and 55 newtons. So that's implement dependent. So if you have an implement that doesn't penetrate at 35 to 55 newtons, but would penetrate at say 150 newtons, then that would not create a stab injury. So you've got to understand how much force is required to penetrate with a particular weapon. So the key issue in deciding whether a weapon creates a sharp force injury during a stabbing attack is whether the threshold force for penetration with that particular implement is met. For a typical stab by a man, the peak force generated is approximately 200 newtons and so if the weapon that's being used is capable of penetrating skin at less than 200 newtons a stab wound would be created. Once the skin is penetrated the weapon will penetrate to considerable depths um, whether or not the stab was mild, moderate or severe. So what this shows is that you need to have a proper forensic investigation for all cases to determine whether or not the tip of the weapon permits penetration at what minimum force. You need to understand the weapon characteristics. So you need to understand the tip radius of the weapon, the minimal force required for penetration, and whether the force required for penetration is greater than that that can be generated by a person stabbing. Okay, and I'll stop there for tonight. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions later. <laughs>